Dear colleagues, uh, welcome to today's uh, European Society Cardiology webinar on the new ESC ESA guidelines how to individualize cardiac risk assessment and treatment. I am uh, Professor Luc Pierrat from University Hospital of Liège in Belgium, and the aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of preoperative management of patients undergoing non cardiac surgery. Two cases will be presented by Prof. Professor Bernard Jung from Bichat Hospital in Paris. And at the end of this 60 minutes uh, live event, you will be able to first discuss risk stratification and indication of investigations in patients with risk factors of complications who should undergo non-cardiac surgery. Two, to review the indications for myocardial revascularization in patients with coronary artery disease before non-cardiac surgery, and third, to discuss the management of patients with severe aortic stenosis who should undergo non-cardiac surgery. Well, this ses session is highly interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions, your comments, at any time during the webinar through the chat. For the best learning experience, we also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice uh, that questions that will be submitted during the presentation. Anything you need to know, just ask, and we will provide tips and tricks for your daily clinical practice. Of course, if there are hundreds of questions, it will not be possible to answer to each of them. And now I will hand over to Professor Bernard Jung. Bernard? Thank you, Luc. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to share with you uh, some aspects of these new guidelines. It's more than an update. These are really uh, new guidelines uh, as compared with the previous uh, 2009 issue. And uh, we will now begin with the first uh, case, uh, which is uh, really a reflect of daily practice. These are really true cases. And uh, this is the case of a patient uh, who is a 79 year old man who has uh, risk factors, uh, cardiovascular risk factors. May I have the first slide, please? He is a past smoker, he has a hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, insulin treated diabetes for five years. And uh, sorry, but uh, we I don't have the slide. Well, maybe we will solve the technical problem. So when waiting for the next slide, uh, just to summarize uh, the story, it's not complicated at that uh, time. Uh, he has a prior history of prostate cancer uh, treated in 2003 uh, using radiation therapy. Uh, so it's patient with the cardiovascular risk factors, uh, uh, prior uh, prostate cancer, no other uh, particular disease. He did not have any cardiac, non-cardiac disease before 2014. Well, here we have the slides, that's good. And uh, the story begins uh, at the end of uh, 2014 uh, with a diagnosis of re rectal adenocarcinoma, uh, which is a large tumor, uh, which is quoted T4 and 1 M0. Uh, the first uh, line treatment was chemotherapy due to the size of the tumor. And fortunately, there was a, a sharp decrease of tumor size and therefore an indication for surgery after five uh, cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, this patient does not have any uh, hard, known heart disease, but he has risk factors. He's 79 years old, and so he's referred to the cardiology consultant for preoperative evaluation. Uh, the patient mentioned uh, NYHA class 3 dyspnea for a couple of months. Uh, he does not complain of any chest pain, but uh, this should be interpreted in the light of limited activity uh, due to uh, uh, cancer. Uh, this patient has uh, limited uh, uh, physical capacity. Uh, clinical examination shows mainly irregular heart rhythm and no signs of heart failure, normal blood pressure, uh, 
True cardiogram uh, shows atrial oscillation uh, with uh, normal heart rate, no other abnormalities, in particular no uh, sequelae of uh, necrosis and no abnormalities of repolarization. Uh, with regard to blood test, uh, serum creatinine is mildly elevated and uh, this uh, results in uh, a glomerular filtration rate of roughly 50 mm per minute and uh, hemoglobin is normal. A cardiographic examination uh, was performed at that stage. It showed normal uh, left ventricular dimensions, uh, normal ejection fraction, uh, mildly enlarged left atrium, no valvular disease, uh, nothing else. Uh, medical therapy associates uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Uh, this patient was treated for a long time with these drugs because of hypertension. Uh, Prevastatin for dyslipidemia, uh, warfarin just uh, recently introduced because of AFib, and insulin. So at that stage, uh, which investigation do you consider before surgery in this 79-year-old uh, patient with risk factors? Uh, do you consider exercise CKG, uh, radionuclide uh, myocardial perfusion imaging, dobutamine stress echo, coronary NGO, or nothing else? Okay, so I invite you to, to vote uh, and select one of the five uh, items, although perhaps that the answer will show that uh, there are several reasonable uh, answers. Uh, you have uh, still uh, approximately 20 seconds. We ask you for the purpose of the vote to give only one answer, but we will see that the, the right answer is not straightforward. But that's the uh, reason why such cases are interesting and open to Perhaps discussion. Perhaps that all items are reasonable. Yes, maybe, well, but maybe. We, we will, will see. see. <laughs> we will have some preferences, but possibly not uh, only one answer. Okay, let's look. Oh, the, <clears throat> the majority, well, it's not a majority, 30% uh, suggest to do an exercise electrocardiogram. 19% uh, myocardial perfusion imaging, 18 dobutamine stress echo, 11% coronary angio, and 21% no further investigation. So perhaps that all five are good? Yes, that's fairly balanced and that's, uh, that's interesting. Well, perhaps not all five uh, are, are right, but uh, anyway, uh, we think that we may have some preferences uh, regarding uh, three answers out of five. Uh, our possible answer uh, were uh, the stress radionuclide myocardial perfusion imaging and dobutamine stress echo, and also the possibility of further, no further investigation. Uh, once, well, uh, I have the slides, uh, it was, took some time. So, um, at the, the two answers that we did not favor were exercise EKG and coronary NGO. And, uh, exercise ECG because the patient is not because in good of the, condition. Because it is likely that the patient will not be able to perform maximal exercise testing. And, and uh, we know that submaximal exercise testing will not be uh, contributive. Um, let's, uh, let's review the, what uh, we can find in these recent guidelines uh, regarding uh, uh, this first question. Uh, we, these guidelines promote a stepwise approach, which is a standard approach which can be used in any patient, and that's a, a very practical aspect of these guidelines. Uh, the first step is to analyze the urgency of surgery. In this case, there is no emergency surgery. Is the patient in active or unstable cardiac condition? Step two, that's not the case. And uh, step three, what is the risk of the surgical procedure? And uh, here uh, we are facing with a patient who should undergo colorectal surgery, that is a surgery uh, which is quoted as intermediate risk according to the combined 30-day risk of cardiovascular death or myocardial infarction. And uh, uh, this uh, risk is estimated between one and five person for this type of surgery. And therefore, uh, we are facing with intermediate risk. We can uh, perhaps uh, say to the attendees that uh, the number of high-risk high procedures 
it's much higher in these up updated guidelines as compared that's to That's true. That's true, Luke, and uh, we should stick on this. That's one of the differences with the previous guidelines, that, that there are uh, many other conditions uh, qualified as high risk. Before, there was only uh, vascular surgery, major vascular surgery, and now uh, certain high-risk procedures uh, of abdominal or thoracic surgery have been added. So to summarize, in this case, uh, no urgent surgery, no unstable condition, and intermediate risk of the surgical procedure. The fourth question is to assess the functional capacity of the patient. We already addressed this issue, and uh, in these guidelines, uh, it is recommended not to perform a standardized exercise testing for every patient, of course, but on the basis of a clinical examination and a history of the patient, trying to determine if the patient is or not able uh, to perform an exercise equivalent to four mets, uh, that is roughly climbing two flights of stairs uh, or uh, walking up a hill. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, we have uh, already mentioned that the patient uh, is not in very good general condition, and clearly uh, we cannot consider that this patient can exercise more than four mets, and we should consider that he has a poor or undetermined functional capacity. Which is not necessarily easy to, to determine. No, of course, as for any stressor, this may be difficult. This may be difficult in elderly patients with comorbidities. This may not be related only to heart disease itself. Uh, but uh, anyway, we should stick with these uh, uh, considerations. And uh, so we, this led us to the fifth step, that is a patient with functional capacity which is considered poor. Uh, and at this stage, we should come back to the uh, risk of surgery, which is intermediate risk of surgery. And here, guidelines uh, recommend in these patients uh, that invasive, non-invasive testing may be considered. It's a 2B recommendation, so it's, it's not absolutely necessary to perform it, uh, but it may be considered. There is one, qu one question regarding the case, uh, <coughs> asking how long the atrial fibrillation it, we, don't, we don't know uh, that uh, patient was not uh, known to have AFib. Uh, he described uh, shortness of breath for two months approximately, so possibly uh, AFib started two months ago. But as it is the case in uh, many circumstances, uh, we cannot determine accurately the onset of AFib. Another point, perhaps interesting to discuss <coughs> a few seconds. Uh, an attendee uh, says that you would not recommend a butamine echo and myotidin scintigraphy due to atrial fibrillation and different duration of cardiac cycles. Well, this um, should be taken into account, but this patient has a, a good control rate of AFib, or a good control ventricular rate, uh, with not uh, uh, with not important dispersion between the RR intervals, so. Uh, in our experience, these patients can undergo uh, radionuclide imaging in good condition. For dobutamine stress echo, it may be a little bit more difficult. Uh, but anyway, uh, these uh, uh, stress testing are uh, considered to be more robust and have better predictive performances than uh, exercise EKG. So if we come back to our patient in immediate surgery, uh, if he has one or more clinical risk factors, we should consider non-invasive testing. Uh, it is important to stress that here we are not uh, sticking with uh, cardiovascular risk factors, but with clinical risk factors of perioperative complications during non-cardiac surgery. Uh, here, this is one of uh, uh, the most frequently used risk score, which is the revised cardiac index, or the Lee score, which was described more than 10 years ago. Uh, other scores have been described uh, since uh, this publication. However, it uh, remains widely used because it is very easy to use at bedside and uh, it has the strength to have been validated in a number uh, of different uh, settings. And if we consider our patient, he had renal dysfunction with a glomerular filtration rate below 60 and diabetes mellitus, that is two risk factors according to the revised cardiac index, no, is no non ischemic heart disease, no angina or previous MI, no heart failure, no cerebrovascular disease. So he has two risk factors, so we are in a circumstance where uh, non-invasive stress testing uh, may be performed. May I interrupt you just a few seconds? Uh, 
Uh, somebody asked for whether a six minutes word test uh, could be interesting regarding the difficulty to, this, to assess. This uh, may help uh, to determine the functional capacity. However, there are no data validating six minute word test with in regard the to the risk of perioperative mm -hmm. complications. So That's the not reason why in the, guidelines. the threshold of formats was uh, still mentioned. So if we look at the recommendation on stress testing in asymptomatic patient, as it is here, that is without angina, uh, the only class one recommendation is in before high risk surgery uh, in patients with more than two clinical risk factors. That's not the case here. Uh, as previously mentioned, we are facing with a to be recommendation a patient to have uh, intermediate risk surgery and one or two clinical risk factors. That, that implies that Patients with high risk surgery and two risk factors, it's still a class 2B. It's still a class 2B. As you see, these recommendations are quite uh, restrictive, but uh, uh, we will see in part the rational. So, uh, if we come back to the first question, it was not a bad answer to consider no further investigation because it's only a 2B recommendation. That's not a strong recommendation. It was not. It was also uh, uh, appropriate to consider uh, non-invasive uh, ischemia testing. However, we know that there are sometimes gaps between practice and guidelines. And uh, what happened in the, uh, with this patient, uh, which happened was that the coronary angiography was performed straightforward without prior testing. And here we can see the result uh, of coronary angio. Left uh, coronary angiogram is okay. However, the bad surprise that what to find this tight stenosis of the second segment of coronary uh, uh, artery. And uh, this was unexpected. Uh, probably if we stick to the guidelines, coronary angiography was not mandatory, but it was performed. It was not mandatory because if we look at the recommendation on preoperative coronary angio, uh, this recommendation cons are mainly related not to uh, uh, systematic coronary angio, but to coronary angio uh, within the usual indications of coronary angio uh, in patients with uh, severe symptomatic uh, angina or after acute coronary syndrome. This was not the case here. Uh, before endarterectomy uh, of the carotid, that's uh, another story. Uh, and uh, it's not uh, routinely used in patients uh, who should undergo low risk surgery. It's not the case here. So clearly, our patient does not match uh, one of these indications. But coronary injury has been performed, perhaps inappropriately, but we know that this may happen. You have this coronary angio in front of you, so what do you advise? Do you consider in the light of coronary angiograms that it is necessary to perform PCI before non-cardiac surgery? Do you think that it is necessary at that time to perform stress testing? Do you think that it is necessary to postpone non-cardiac surgery or to proceed with non-cardiac surgery? Okay, so... <clears throat> You remind us that the patient had no angina. Yeah. He had just dyspnea. Only dyspnea. There are several interesting questions uh, which will be probably answered uh, later on. Uh, there is one about uh, the role of natriuretic peptides, BNP, and possibly troponin as part of the risk assessment. Troponin is not really justified in this asymptomatic patient uh, with normal EKG. BNP has been uh, studied and has been shown to have a, a predictive value on post-operative cardiac events. However, it has not been convincingly proven to have an incremental predictive value as compared with clinical, usual clinical risk factors. Uh, with BNP and anti-proBNP, we have to face with threshold. So that's the reason why it's not included in this uh, risk score. So I have the result. Uh, approximately one half, 47 percent, should perform the PCI, and 30 percent uh, should perform stress imaging. Uh, only five percent would suggest to postpone non-cardiac surgery, and 18 percent would like to proceed with non-cardiac surgery. Well, so majority uh, for a PCI, for PCI. Of, of this tight Once stenosis. we have seen the stenosis, it's difficult not to perform PCI. Well, that was not uh, our choice, uh, and we uh, choose to proceed with non-cardiac surgery. Why? Uh, if we look at the prophylactic coronary revascularization in stable cardiac patients, we all agree that this patient has stable 
uh, cardiac disease. Uh, if we look uh, at the last line, uh, clearly it is mentioned in the guidelines that routine prophylactic myocardial revascularization before low or intermediary surgery, this is the case here, in patients with proven ischemic heart disease is not recommended. Uh, that does not mean that uh, we will not take into account this coronary stenosis at all, and the late revascularization after non-cardiac surgery uh, should be considered according to the guidelines, but in this particular context of a patient who should undergo intermediate risk non-cardiac surgery, it is not recommended to consider myocardial revascularization at that stage. And what are the reasons for this somewhat paradoxical uh, uh, recommendation. Uh, this is related to the demonstrated risk of, uh, high, of a high rate of events when non-cardiac surgery is performed early after myocardial revascularization uh, using PCI. Uh, the first study was published more than 10 years ago. It was a small study uh, showing high rates of uh, uh, major cardiac events when non-cardiac surgery was performed within the first six weeks after bare metal stent implantation, in particular during the first two weeks, mainly due to uh, discontinuation of antithrombotic therapy. Uh, this was uh, uh, confirmed and enhanced by a more recent and much larger study in a more contemporary setting, uh, showing a high rate of MACE, 10%, when non-cardiac surgery was performed in the months following uh, PCI. And more recently, two years ago, uh, from a very large registry of more than uh, 40,000 procedures of non-cardiac surgery, there was a clear relationship between early cardiac surgery, uh, early non-cardiac surgery performed after PCI and the risk of major adverse cardiac events. There was no significant difference according to the stent type, whether it was bare metal stent or drug eluting stent, and uh, this uh, increased risk was particularly mar marked in high-risk patients with a, a revised cardiac index greater than 2. So even if it, there is a PCI with a bare metal stent, in this patient with atrial fibrillation, it would be in, <coughs> uh, related to a triple therapy for at least uh, several weeks. And there is a question that perhaps right. you, you will answer that later on on the evaluation of the patient. Would restoration of sinus rhythm improve fun patient's functional capacity and hence reduces operative risk? Perhaps later on the, the answer? I, I don't know that this will have a major impact impact on uh, uh, functional capacity and at that stage, but we will see that uh, this question may have an impact and uh, we will come back to this later okay. on. So given this uh, information, we choose to perform uh, cardiac, uh, non-cardiac surgery uh, without uh, postponing surgery. Uh, at that stage, which uh, post-operative, perioperative medical therapy do you recommend? Uh, not taking into account antithrombotic therapy uh, for this question. Uh, just to remind that this patient was previously treated using beta blockers, calcium channel inhibitors, and statins for hypertension and dyslipidemia. Do you think that it's necessary to interrupt the beta blocker? Uh, do you think that it's uh, necessary to continue beta blocker? To continue beta blockers and statins? Uh, or to add nitrates? So this is a question related really to the patient? Yes, yeah, okay. it's really patient-based as it is for there the is general an case. an interesting question. Why not to do fractional flow reserve during angiography? Well, this may have been considered, but once again, but even if, if we would have uh, performed fractional flow reserve, and clearly the stenosis is uh, very tight, there is no doubt about this, but once again, we are not considering an indication of myocardial revascularization in a general ambulatory patient, but in the particular setting of non-cardiac surgery. Okay, this is a clear answer. Uh, only 3% would uh, interrupt beta blockers, and uh, the majority, more than 80%, will continue keep both beta blockers and statin, 81%. Well, at that time, we fully agree with the majority. This may happen sometimes. And, uh, of course, this is a good answer, but we uh, 
chose to ask this question because there may be some confusion with the role of perioperative beta blockers. You know that there have been uh, many concerns with the perioperative uh, prescription of beta blocker therapy, and this is one of the major changes of this issue of the guidelines as compared with the previous one. And uh, when considering the indication for starting beta blockers before non-cardiac surgery, now this indication has been downgraded and are only class 2B recommendation in very selected patients. However, this does not translate to patients who were previously treated using beta blockers, and it is clearly stated that perioperative continuation of beta blockers is recommended in patients currently receiving this medication, uh, regardless of the indication for which they were treated using beta blockers. This is a class 1 recommendation. Uh, the concerns uh, regarding uh, the use of beta blockers during the perioperative period uh, are not related to uh, their cardioprotective effect, which has been shown in many studies, but uh, uh, on uh, the interpretation of the risk-benefit analysis, because in the large POIS2 trial, the cardioprotective effect was totally offset by uh, the risk of hypertension, resulting in higher rates of stroke and finally uh, of all-cause death. However, Hypertension occurs mainly when beta blockers are introduced just before non-cardiac surgery. At and a high dose. In particular, if it's at high dose just before surgery, as it was designed in the POIS trial. Uh, and on the other hand, there is strong evidence in the literature showing an increasing mortality after withdrawal of previous beta blocker therapy. So this patient had beta blocker for hypertension, and it is also useful for AFib and for coronary disease. So clearly we should continue beta blocker therapy. Uh, this is roughly the same with statins. He was already treated, and the perioperative continuation of statin is recommended when patients were previously treated. And as it is the case for beta blockers, on the other hand, the, peri the preoperative introduction of statins is only restricted uh, here in vascular surgery. Another question that was not addressed in, the, in this question is the perioperative antithrombotic therapy, which is complex in this patient. He has recent AFib, he has coronary artery disease, and uh, in the previous recommendations, in the 2009 issue of guidelines, uh, there was a strong advice to use a perioperative aspirin therapy in such patients uh, if uh, it was possible uh, uh, if there was no prohibitive breeding risk. Uh, these recommendations uh, are also uh, uh, an illustration of changes between the two uh, guidelines uh, and uh, the, the use of aspirin, of perioperative aspirin, has clearly been downgraded. Uh, we can see on this table uh, that the discontinuation of aspirin in previously treated patient should be considered in patient in whom hemostasis is anticipated to be difficult, and this is a 2A recommendation, and uh, the continuation of aspirin may be considered based on the bleeding risk, and it is a to be recommendation. So it's a shift. Uh, uh, the strongest recommendation, the 2A, is rather in favor of discontinuation of aspirin, and continuation is possible as a to be. This is a contrary uh, on the previous recommendations. This is mainly due to recent uh, evidence uh, from the POIS2 trial, which was a large randomized trial uh, in which a patient were randomized to receive aspirin or to continue aspirin if they were previously treated uh, before surgery. It was a placebo-controlled trial in patients with high vascular risk, and there were no difference in perioperative deaths, no difference in life-threatening bleeding, but a significant increase in major bleed in patients receiving aspirin as compared uh, to those receiving placebo. Uh, this should be interpreted according to the patient characteristics. Only a fourth of them had non-CAD. But anyway, uh, this uh, recent uh, study published at the end of last year uh, led to reconsider uh, the role of aspirin in the perioperative setting. So finally, after a multidisciplinary discussion, and it was a tough discussion because, of course, the interventionist wanted absolutely to dilate the coronary artery. Uh, the anesthesiologists were concerned with the stenosis, and uh, we also were concerned by recent AFib. And uh, to come back to one of the precedent uh, questions, uh, we chose to 
perform cardioversion under heparin after transesophageal to restore sinus rhythm, we bridge uh, warfarin therapy using enoxaparin, and uh, we continue aspirin in this patient with a severe coronary disease, uh, restoring sinus rhythm, and therefore uh, hoping that uh, we will have more flexible uh, antithrombotic therapy with regard to AFib uh, during the perioperative period. That's not a recommendation, that was our choice. Perhaps we were right, perhaps we were wrong, uh, but it illustrates difficulties of combined antithrombotic therapy. The patient underwent uh, colorectal surgery 12 days after. Postoperative outcome was not simple. He had a hypotension, in particular due to bleeding. Uh, this patient had prior pelvic radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Hemostasis was difficult. This was a large tumor. And uh, also we uh, interrupted enoxaparin more than 24 hours before surgery and more than two days afterwards uh, since the patient was in sinus rhythm. Uh, bleeding occurs and it was not easy. Uh, AFib recover, uh, recur at day five. But anyway, with regard to the coronary status, there was only a minor uh, troponin raised without EKG changes, and hemodynamics remained stable. Okay, there are several questions. I don't think that we have time to answer to all. Uh, there were two questions regarding sin possible silent ischemia or dyspnea as an anginal equivalent in a diabetic patient. Uh, there is a question uh, about uh, the PCI after uh, the intervention, if it's not complicated. Uh, and, uh, well, there is also perhaps interesting, the dose of enoxaparin is, of course, lower mm. because of renal dysfunction. Yes, that's true. Uh, of course, there are many potential uh, questions reg with uh, regards to, to these patients. Um, once again, I will uh, begin with uh, the issue of stress testing because it's, uh, uh, of course, a, a frequent question. And to, to conclude with this case, this highlights uh, the need for individual approach. As there is no universal rule. Uh, we have a stepwise approach, but uh, you have seen that at each step there are a number of questions and we should address these issues <coughs> in the light of the patient we have in front of us. And, uh, <coughs> If uh, we uh, consider uh, the problem of coronary uh, stenosis, clearly uh, documentation of uh, ischemia uh, may be performed in this case, but uh, it will uh, change the management only in uh, uh, small uh, cases because uh, there are restricted indications for myocardial revascularization before surgery. And the case, um, we did not detail all the guidelines, of course, but uh, preoperative revascularization uh, is mainly to be considered outside the clinical setting in patients with large extent ischemia. Uh, and uh, this patient has a single vessel disease, so uh, we choose in this case to to perform, uh, to go with straightforward surgery uh, with an optimal perioperative uh, medical therapy, uh, once again taking into account the, the hazards of non-cardiac surgery performed early after myocardial revascularization. Surgery was not urgent, but the abdominal surgeon and the oncologist uh, did not wish to postpone the surgery more than two weeks uh, because of the good response to chemotherapy and the initial uh, size of the tumor. I think the management of antithrombotic therapy uh, would, of course, be another webinar. There are some questions we have no time to answer. So what to do uh, if the patient is on NOAC uh, and not on warf warfarin. Another <coughs> just, right? just uh, to, to ad briefly address this issue, but because of NOACs are widely used and, are, uh, and there are concerns regarding uh, their prescription in the perioperative setting, I think we should be very cautious uh, with NOACs. Most of them have a short half-life, more much shorter than vitamin K blockers. However, there are important individual variation and uh, in surgery which may be complicated with bleeding, as it was the case here, uh, it is necessary uh, to uh, withdraw NOAC therapy uh, several days before surgery. This may depend on the drug uh, and patient age, renal function, and so on. Uh, but uh, really, we should not consider withdrawing the, the drug one or two days before because it's short half-life. We know that this attitude may be associated with severe bleeding, and uh, roughly the attitude is the same than with vitamin K blocker. 
withdrawal several days before and bridging with an oxaparin, of course at lower dose, taking into account the renal function of the patient. Just a, a detail, would you keep also sotalol, probably because it increased QT interval? Not in this case. Uh, you, would, uh, we, you will not withdraw sotalol and replace by another beta no, blocker? No, we prefer to keep the same beta blocker, which is bisoprolol, which has a, a, a good evidence with cardioprotection. We don't have data regarding sotalol in the particular perioperative use. It has class 3 properties. This may be helpful in some settings, but not necessarily in this case. 